Well, I'm delighted to say that uh, joining me on the Godcast today is Peter Cardwell. Now, Peter is the political editor at, and presenter at Talk Radio. He is a public speaker. He's a political commentator. Um, he also runs um, uh, the Geddes Trust and um, uh, formerly was a special advisor to for cabinet ministers. Peter, welcome to the Godcast. How are you? Hi, Alex. Great to be here. Thanks very much for having me. Very good. You've got a, a rich uh, Northern Ireland accent there, but I presume you, you're you're far from home. Are you where are you based? London way or? Yeah, I live in I live in London. I've been in England for most of the last twenty years, but I haven't really lost the accent. Do Do you miss home ever? Uh yeah, a bit. I used to get very homesick actually, but uh, since I bought a flat about two years ago, I've definitely put down proper roots here. Really, so I suppose I'm sort of a Londoner. Yeah. And and um, this this career of yours, it's um, it's diverse, if nothing else. Are you you are you enjoying the uh, the presenting aspect at Talk Radio? That's a, a station that's evolving quite quickly, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's really exciting what we're doing, and there's a lot more to come actually as well. But yeah, I present a program on Saturdays between ten o'clock in the morning and one o'clock in the afternoon, and that's what I do once a week. And then the rest of the time, I'm the political editor, so I um, I'm on. Usually Mondays to Thursdays, but a bit on Fridays as well. Sometimes, depending on the news, and uh, sometimes you think you have a day off, and then something big happens. Just last week, for example, um, the uh, party gate uh, stuff happened in terms of the committee uh, talking about Boris Johnson. So that made for a very busy Friday, which is supposedly my day off. But uh, that was that was really interesting. And the thing is that I'm I'm paid money to talk about my passion, and it's always been my passion. So that's something that I really really enjoy. Yeah. People who are familiar with the Godcast may think that I'm working my way through talk radio presenters. You, you uh, David Bull was on just a few weeks ago. Ian Collins uh, is someone yeah. I keep in touch with. We've had Isabel Oakshot, we've had Richard Tice, and now yourself. So it's fabulous to get you on, Peter. Um, let, let's um, let's get down to some questions. I, I, I was interested to know that uh, you wrote this book, um, uh, The Secret Life uh, of the Special Advisor. And in this current climate, Peter, I'm wondering what special advice you might give to the Prime Minister um, as as we are rapidly approaching the next general election. Yeah, well, it's interesting just today as we speak on Friday the 10th of March, um, the Prime Minister has been with President Macron in France. And I think the policy in terms of stopping the boats is something that's been couched, certainly in the language of fairness. And that's something that a lot of people who voted Conservative in 2019 and may be wavering as to whether they'll do the same thing in 2024, maybe thinking about. So it's interesting those policies really are there to win votes, but also to solve a massive problem. In terms of Rishi Sunak, I think he hasn't communicated enough. I think that he uh, needs to do more interviews. We need to get to know him a bit more. I think that he's a bit of a submarine prime minister, really, and a lot of the communication strategy I would probably do slightly differently if I were advising him. But at the same time, he is, uh, I think, the, the you know making politics more straightforward, making it less dramatic, less in, making it more about less about the personalities and more about the policy, more about what the country needs to do to get back on track. I think is something that is very very wise, and I think people may not like Narishi Sunak necessarily, but they don't hate him, and they also realise that if he's a technocrat who looks at all the evidence and looks at the spreadsheets and all the rest of it, well, that's probably better than uh, some of what has perhaps gone before. Uh, but it's interesting because Sir Keir Starmer is someone who presents quite a big threat, but at the same time, he's not seen as being the most charismatic or having the most personality, but then neither really is Rishi Sunak. So it's interesting, we're in a very, very different political situation to we were even a year ago. And I think the rough and tumble and the the um, personality stuff is really interesting to report and to talk about. And the soap opera aspect is, is big, but it really turns people off politics as well. And really at talk radio, and talk TV, a lot of our listeners just want the government to get on with things and do things properly and run the country properly, probably like uh, most people. And I think that the, the personality stuff needs to end and, and kind of has ended really for a while. So in, in many senses, Rishi Sunak's on the right track with that. Yeah, do, do you you referenced him as a kind of a submarine prime minister. Why do you think that is? Because what, one thing, you know, whether it's about personalities, if you remove the personality, when he actually engages in the political debate, Peter, it seems quite uh, rational. It seems quite um, sensible. Um, you know, I find him quite an interesting character. It, it's kind of minus all the colour blue, isn't it, and all the all the noise that came with the previous leaders. Do, do you think um, he's been advised to be 
kind of a submarine prime minister? Yes, but also I think he is. I mean, the he just is as a person. I worked with Rishi Sunak for a time when I was a special advisor in government, and he's just not a, a massive personality. He's, he's a very engaging person, very nice person, but he's not. Uh, it's not all about him. He realizes that government is about people rather than about him. So I think that um, in terms of what certainly the early stages, it was almost as if he got the kind of Donald Trump. Uh, red cap and said you know make politics boring again and certainly before Christmas it made sense just to calm down and not do very much but I think now he needs to perhaps communicate a bit more and uh, be very clearly in control really but certainly a vast difference from Boris Johnson and even Liz Truss actually they're two they're very very different characters to Rishi Sunak so um, I think it's funny the public haven't really warmed to Rishi Sunak they still see Keir Starmer as uh, more of a credible leader and that is possibly due, well, I'm sure it's to do with how Rishi Sunak runs things, but also I think it's just that after 13 years, any leader in that particular uh, situation would have an uphill struggle, as John Major did in, in 1992. There are some people are suggesting that the next general election is a foregone conclusion, Peter. I don't know if you subscribe to that view, but but it, it does leave me wondering, you know, the, the red wall uh, areas, Burnley being one of those that, that went conservative, uh, well, uh, probably the f well was the first time in my lifetime, you know, and and, and probably because of Brexit. Do you, do you think that the next general election is a foregone conclusion, or or how do you kind of see that playing out? No, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion. I think Labour will be the biggest party, but the question is whether they're a majority or not. I've looked at all sorts of polling, all sorts of bits of information, I've spoken to people behind the scenes, and this is not um, really, it's there for the taking for Labour, certainly in the opinion polls, but Labour in front, uh, certainly by about 20, 20 points average of 21, 22 points. But we're still quite a long way away and lots can happen. They've been, I think as we speak here, I think it's 482 days that Labour have been ahead in the polls and that's a long time. But it doesn't necessarily mean that, that translates to the ballot box. And Rishi Sunak does have a bit of time. I, I think the local elections in May will probably go badly for the Conservative Party, but that might be a bit of the bloodletting that's needed. The big question as well is Scotland and what effect a new leader of the SNP has and whether Labour, who really need to win in Scotland, can get uh, maybe... 12, 18 seats there, which would be really, really good for them. They've only got one at the moment. So if Labour can come back in Scotland a bit, well, that's what they need to have a majority. So in terms of Scottish independence, that might be really fascinating, especially if you're in a situation where Labour are a my minority administration and occasionally, maybe not all the time, but occasionally need the support of the SNP. That would be fascinating because what's the, what's the bargain for that? So there's so many hypotheticals in all yeah. of this. Um, I, I can't see a Conservative majority after the next election, but I, you know, I, I've been wrong before and I'll be wrong again. Yeah, I, I want to come back to Scotland in in a few minutes, Peter, if I can, because I'm fascinated by what's going on up there as well. But but actually, um, I was wondering how, what you thought about, you know, and this is not a criticism of, of talk radio, but there is, um, we are awash with political uh, radio, uh, political debate, it's kind of 24-7, isn't it? There is not a minute where um, if you want to engage with politics, then, you know, it's there all the time. Is 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 that a good thing, Peter? It, it strikes me that uh, politicians are so much under the microscope. There's not much oxygen knocking about for them to actually just get on and do stuff. I was just wondering what your thoughts were. Yeah, it's funny. I have a, I have a slightly weird perspective on this, having been sort of a journalist for 10 years, then in government for three and a half years, and now a journalist again. I do believe that sometimes privacy is needed in order to get things done. I think if you look at the recent Brexit uh, victory, really, in regard to uh, the final bit of Brexit getting done, obviously, some people would disagree with that and say that, that there's been a you know, horrendous betrayal and so on. But um, in terms of Northern Ireland and that deal, um, they went into what was called the tunnel and there were times when there were only two civil servants in the whole of the government who really knew what was going on in all of the different aspects of what was happening in those negotiations. And that led to a good, a good ending, uh, really a good deal for Britain, although many people w will say will disagree with me on that, but I, I think they're wrong. Um, so sometimes privacy is needed, sometimes catching a breath and actually having a bit of space to disagree without that disagreement being torn apart is really, really important. But at the same time, as someone who's political under a talk, there there are 
you know, the democratization of opinion is fantastic. We have people who would never dream of ringing a radio program who text in every week, perhaps every day. Uh, we have people who tweet, for example, uh, we have people who tweet and then engage with each other. Um, that's sort of slightly separate to what's on the radio as well, even though some of their tweets may be read out. So I think really there are a lot of people now who have a voice in a way that they didn't before. The news was sort of handed to them on tablets of stone. Uh, and uh, no, no offense, Alex. And uh, there was, um, I think it's just something that is is a bit different now and a bit more uh, democratised. Now, obviously, there are people who have voices that are perhaps too loud uh, when they're saying things that are uh, unhelpful or, well, not unhelpful, but uh, it's fine to be unhelpful, but uh, perhaps racist or incendiary or inciting violence. And that rightly is within the law. But I'm a big fan of free speech. I'm a big fan of freedom of expression. And I think that people should have the right to, to put their point across. And actually... What I think talk has done in the last few years is make sure that we can have a, a reasonable conversation around immigration, for example, because clearly there's been a massive problem and we want to be compassionate, as many people have been, in terms of taking in Ukrainian refugees, um, the reception people from Hong Kong have received in this country, for example, with British passports or others from Afghanistan and Iraq over the years, whereas previously... I would say even five or six years ago to even mention immigration in a critical way would be open yourself to being accused of, of being racist. So I think there are um, really good ways in that, yes, there's a lot of noise, but with, with the heat, there is quite a lot of light as well. And I think people feel more engaged now than they have before. Yeah. And and, and in terms of the opposition, Peter, well, it, it strikes me that the gains that Labour foresee are not necessarily through their own kind of policies, but actually more through the predicament and, and the, the disappointment that people feel in the Conservative Party. Is is that fair? And then and and, and if that, that is the case, does it ultimately come down to a personality contest between, you know, uh, two, as you describe, rather straight-laced, almost dreary char characters? Well, we, we may have a very different election where that's not the case. And that's why I think some of these dividing lines, for example, the small boats legislation are coming through, that there really are big disagreements. Obviously, in 2019, between Corbyn and, and uh, Boris Johnson, it was you know massive gulf, both in personality and in policy. Whereas now, I think in 24, there may not be such a gulf in personality, but there will be in policy. And we'll see more policies, I think, from, from all both parties, certainly Labour has a very bold offering on childcare, for example, which I think for young couples, people maybe with one kid, two cars in the drive, thinking of having a second kid, those are the people that Labour think they can really reach out to and, and, uh, and grab and get them to vote for them. Uh, the red wall is going to be fascinating in terms of where those votes go, but also in the cities as well. And on the southwest, uh, can the Liberal Democrats come back? And I mean, I think there, there are lots of policies. It's a lot about uh, politics. Certainly in the last few years has been probably too much about personality. Although having a strong personality in, in terms of Boris Johnson worked for him really well. He connects like very few politicians that I've seen in my lifetime. Maybe maybe people like Tony Blair, Nigel Farage, actually, in a very different way. Uh, Bill Clinton and, and Donald Trump, actually, are probably the ones who really properly connect, whereas so many politicians haven't. But uh, maybe it's not such a bad thing that we have two people who are sort of evenly matched, really, in terms of personality. But and, and let the policies speak for themselves and people will have their say on what they will do on their record rather than what well, they sort of like the look of them. But uh, but politics is a very emotional thing. It's a very um, it's really about a feeling. It's less about every single thing that happens. I mean, I cover the minutiae from day to day. This person said this, this inquiry is happening, uh, you know, and I think a lot of it will be forgotten. And really, people will only re at voting time really only remember a few things because so much of the noise is forgotten actually and i wonder you know when, when things happen such as the party gate report for example i remember people say oh you know it's curtains for for the conservatives and um, it certainly uh, it's speeded the end of boris johnson's uh, demise but at the same time i'm not sure too many people are going to think oh well sue gray wrote this in this report therefore i'm voting labor or therefore i'm voting conservative so uh, I, I, it's more a feeling that people have it's more an impression that people have of politics along the way rather than uh, necessarily what uh, how they rather than every single event. And it's interesting, having worked on elections previously, um, I mean, in 2017, for example, for the Conservative Party, I was someone who, you know, for six weeks it had been my life and really nobody, I, my friends certainly weren't really engaging with it. And then sort of four or five days before the end, they went, oh, hold on, there's an election on Thursday. And that, that really changed their minds. And Tony Blair said in his book, A Journey, he said that the hardest thing for any practising politician to remember, and this is true of political journalists as well, 
is that most people, most days of the week, don't give politics a second thought. Now, I think that listeners and, and, and viewers of Talk TV do give it more than a second thought. They're very, very engaged people, but they're not everybody. Um, and I think there are a lot of people who will see a headline, hear a little snippet, maybe on a commercial radio station, maybe see a bit of the six o'clock news, but to them, politics is not their life. And that's something that I have to remember every single day as a political editor. Yeah, I find that fascinating with having young young adults in my house and, and how disengaged they are with politics, actually, and 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 they just think I'm boring when I bring it up. And, and they, well, they, they may not feel it's, it's very relevant to them, but, you know, when you get older, when you become a homeowner, um, when you if you're trying to become a homeowner, you know, if you buy a car, if you get a job, start paying taxes, um, if you have to go to the hospital every now and again for, for some sort of problem, th- those are the those are the ways that I know anyway I've been engaged in, in politics and that yeah. I, I really feel those policies have, have affected my life. And I suppose with young people, they're, they're sort of an almost a fetish, fetishization by the media. What do young people think? And I sort of think, well, you might have for a while, there was a program on BBC called Young Voters Question Time. And I sort of thought what I really want is, you know, pensioners question time or uh, 35 to 45 with kids question time. Um, you know, I, I really I really think there, there's so many other subsets that we need to be more interested in rather than simply just young people. Yeah. And 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 in regard to Boris, Peter, is is uh, is politics better with him or without him? Certainly more interesting with him um, in terms of how things ran, in terms of how things were. Uh, certainly there's more chaos and it was it was more of a soap opera. Um, in terms of is he a good leader, I don't really think he is. Uh, but at the same time, he's a fantastic campaigner. And that's what I would say are probably the different, the main difference between Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak. Boris Johnson is an excellent campaigner, not a particularly good governor, whereas Rishi Sunak, I think, has proven, certainly in the last few days, that he has qualities. If He may not be perfect, but he has qualities as a governor. The question is, is he a good campaigner? Uh, because he's had quite a rapid rise in politics. He hasn't had a fight, really, for too many things uh, in the way that, that other people have, although obviously he lost uh, the first... Uh, time in the contest in the summer so it'll be really interesting certainly coming up to the local elections in just a couple of months time whether Rishi Sunak um, actually uh, is, is a fighter and a big campaigner in all of this. Yeah Peter just on a personal level you've been a a, a journalist a broadcaster an advisor have you ever yourself considered you know actually put yourself forward as a candidate for parliament? Um, I considered it for about five seconds and uh, the thing is that I've seen a lot of I know a lot of people who are really good candidates uh, on all sides, actually. I know people who are MPs and they, they do a really, really, really tough job. Um, and uh, this goes for councillors as well and assembly members in Northern Ireland in particular. I know a few of those. And uh, it's a really, really tough job. Lots and lots of scrutiny. And I think it's not my skill set. Um, I do What I did enjoy about politics is, is solving problems for people. And I, I, I enjoyed that. But there's just so much scrutiny of your life, everything you've ever said and done. Uh, that it's it sort of put me off to be honest and the i would say the second best book about politics published in the last five years after my own uh is uh is uh, isabel hardman's book the the uh, why we got the wrong politicians which is a really really good insight into this and i think there's there's more to do on that i, I think that's um i just want to i just uh my mind cast back to an interview i had jeffrey archer came on um and, and he made the argument that, uh, that members of parliament just aren't paid enough and and I can't remember, it could have been Ken Clark who raised this maybe 18 months or so ago, and there was a lot of ridicule in the media about this. Do you think, uh, for the scrutiny that MPs get, Peter, that they are uh, reasonably uh, reimbursed for their for their work? Well, MPs get paid nearly three times the national average wage, and I think that is something that a lot of people feel aggrieved about. I think people feel they get paid too much. And of course, if they're a minister, their um, payment, their salary usually goes into the six figures, depending if they're a junior minister or secretary of state. So, I mean, like many things in politics, it goes back to that BBC documentary, The Thick of It, uh, where they say, um, you know, the politi- one uh, politician's complaining about a salary and uh, Malcolm Tucker says, this public want, to, want you to live in a cave and eat grass. Um, I think if we did have, Bigger, you know, bigger salaries, we'd probably get a greater caliber of person. But it's not just about salary. I think we need to have a conversation with, with ourselves about what kind of politicians we want. It goes back to Isabel's book in terms of saying we criticize all these people from one angle of being on the make, horrible, corrupt people who are only in it for themselves. And then on the other side, say, well, why don't we have good people in politics? I was like, well, those two are absolutely linked. And the thing is, and the thing that frustrates me 
a lot of the time is yes, there are uh, corrupt, venal, dreadful people in politics. Of course, there are. There's been a lot of evidence of that over the past number of years. But there are also some very, very good people in politics who do a good job. And tarring them all with the same brush is is unfair. In the same way as you know, they're good and bad political journalists. They're good and bad um, ministers of religion. They're good and bad shop assistants, doctors, whatever. And just simply to say they're all the same is uh, is just unfair. Yeah. Peter, this is a whistle stop tour. I appreciate that, but I, I love getting uh, uh, people who are into politics, and, and and I'm just thinking about my own context here in Burnley, which is, um, in many ways, is a wonderful place to live and work, but also it's a it is a place without and uh, not without problems, huge problems of poverty, uh, huge problems of addiction. Um, I haven't really seen, uh, you know, and, and I think it matters to people who, who work and live in this kind of environment, you know, when there's a lot of crime about when there is, um, you know, there's not a great feeling about the place. I haven't really seen a political party address that really, you know, and, and when I think about the cost of living crisis, um, I can't really say I've seen huge inroads into it. You know, I'm, uh, you, you know, I'm a bit of a, a bit of a floating vulture, if I'm being honest. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I just don't, understand why we have so many food banks i don't i don't get that as a concept that i you know we've had lots of plaudits in recent years about our food banks but i actually hate i hate my food bank i hate the fact that anybody needs a food bank who's addressing that peter and, and what needs to be addressed i don't think it is being addressed nearly enough um the question i suppose people need to ask is what do you want government to do for you do you want it to solve all your problems or do you want it to be there when you need it to be there for some people it's both um, for some people, uh, there can't be high enough public spending and taxes should be high because uh, people who can afford it should pay. And there is vast wealth equality in this country, as you've correctly pointed out there. And I think that uh, there, the government can't solve all your problems. That's the one thing I learned from being in government. I mean, it takes people to, to try to solve them for themselves. But at the same time, if you're living in the kind of conditions that you've talked about, which are very different to the conditions I'm living in here in London, well, that is something that you may not feel there's any way out and you may well look for pol to politicians to solve your problems for you. And I can totally understand that. In terms of, uh, I mean, the, be the best thing any government can do is to create jobs, uh, because if you have a job, you're going to have a decent income, hopefully. Uh, and the cost of living crisis, you know, inflation will be down. And that's what both parties essentially are trying to do. They're trying to make life easier for people with labour. It's things to do with childcare, it's creating jobs, it's growth. Uh, and with um, the Conservatives, it's similar things, but at the same time, they're trying to get down inflation. They're trying to, um, make, trying to eradicate the cost of living crisis. Whether their efforts will work or not. And the thing is that, again, being in government, but also covering politics, the government isn't in control of everything. Um, and nor should it be necessarily. But in terms of the economy, there are global factors. You know, the war in Ukraine is a big one. And there are all sorts of uh, inflationary crisis. Migration is, is a big problem and uh, opportunity for many countries as well. So it's really, really difficult to say to someone who's in the kind of situation that you're uh, outlining there, well, actually, um, you know, the help isn't necessarily all there perhaps the government isn't going to solve everything for you but i know what you mean about food banks i think it is it's it's, it's good that they exist it's good that certainly there are many many voluntary organizations the church is really good i mean i come from quite a religious background i'm not religious myself at all i'm agnostic but i know that there are many many churches that do a really really good job but it is a shame they have to exist it is a shame that um those food banks have to exist because uh, it would be a, a much better world if they didn't and i don't know if there's any obvious or easy solution otherwise it would have been solved already I wonder. Well, I've you know, I'm not, well, I can plug my book. It's my god, my my godcast. But but in my, in my book, I do I do talk about this kind of uh, what I believe is a is a is the, a lack of compassion in in our in our politics. So I was wondering if you agree with this. You know, I I, I, I used to work for Argos in middle middle management, and quite often, Peter, the decisions were taken at a level. Um, where us on the ground thought well, they, they just don't understand the the, re the reality of the situation, and as somebody like yourself who's who's been a special advisor, I was wondering what your your thoughts on that are. Do you think sometimes the disconnect between those at the very top and those where we are, you know, in many cases at the very bottom in Burnley, not everybody but some people, is so massive that there that is where the the gap is and. We need to close the gap there and and uh, create some sort of compassion and a and a and a bubble of aspiration. Uh, what, what do you think? Well, well, I think there are politicians who do understand that they go to constituency surgeries every week and they do try to solve people's problems. But at the same time, if the people who go to constituency surgeries are often people who have exhausted every other avenue 
and this is you know they're pretty desperate and they want an MP to, to solve their problem often very very complex problems so MPs got a quite a skewed view I think of a lot of their constituents and what the constituencies are like and there are actually quite a few people who either would like a little bit more help from government or are happy with or largely happy with what the government does for them in terms of the gap between them yeah absolutely and MPs live a really weird life where you can literally be talking about sewage and drainage in a in a or housing or passports or all the kind of uh, you, you know immigration status all the kind of things that people talk about at MP surgeries on a Friday and then on a Monday you're in this sort of Harry Potter style uh, situation with people with funny wigs and clothes um, talking in in parliamentary language about different things so it's it's a very very strange life for them there are a lot of MPs who do get it. Um, and I do think that we do need greater diversity of MPs. And I mean that not just in terms of race, but also in terms of class. I think it's a, it's a major thing that there are um, fewer uh, people at the top of politics now who've really lived a, a tough life, although there are some. Angela Rayner would be a good example. Um, but there are, I, I think, in terms of what life is really like, that is a tough one. And the more you get into politics, the more removed you are from uh, people's daily lives and, and you see it through a very, very different way. So I think that's why people need to communicate with their politicians. I think they need to write to them, they need to email them, they need to um, engage them at, at events, uh, they need to participate in politics and they need to have their voice heard and if possible stand for election if you want to, whether that's for council or as an MP and, and just be part of the debate. Um, you can ring in or, or uh, text your tweet into Talk TV, for example, and have your voice heard that way. And I think that um, the more agency people have and the more responsibility and the more um, kind of straightforward opinion people have, not only complaining, but also suggesting solutions as well as a lot of our viewers and listeners do every single day. That's a good thing. And that gets into the lexicon. That's, that informs um, politicians in terms of the job they do. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. I just, uh, you know, you said that you're not very religious and you're an agnostic, but I want to move on to Scotland a little bit and this idea of... Um, I, want, I suppose I want to ask you the question is, you know, do, do politics and religion mix? I was really interested in in recent weeks that Kate Forbes, who came out and spoke with, um, you know, a very conservative theology around um, uh, uh, same-sex relationships, etc., cetera, um, had been kind of um, almost tried to be pushed to the sidelines. Mm. I was interested that, that Tim Farron a number of years ago, you know, relinquished his role as uh, leader of the Lib Dens because of his religious views is it all right I mean, and i also think that sometimes the media pushes the extremes i think you know calvin robinson who's also been on the godcast from uh, gb news you know it seems to me that it, um those on the on the fundamentals those on the on the on the on the extreme left or the extreme right get the attention um mm -hmm. and room in the middle is 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 less uh, allowing um yeah so i suppose the question is you know do politics and religion mix i don't i Feel pretty sorry for Kate Forbes in that her only crime was being honest. I disagree with her on basically all her religious views, but if you believe in freedom of expression, freedom of speech, and freedom of religion, you should believe in people's abil ability and freedom to ha to hold those opinions. And what Kate Forbes wasn't saying was that if I were first minister of Scotland, I would you know recriminalise re homosexuality, recriminalise. Uh, or, or alternatively, you know, criminalise um, sex outside marriage. Good luck with that one. Um, but it, it, I mean, with Tim Farron as well, I, I felt a bit sorry for him as well at the time when he was leader of the Lib Dems. I don't think it was too bad a leader of the Lib Dems. But there are certain decisions that have been made. And I think people, a lot of people are very vocal. People feel that there are views that are unacceptable. Um, I mean, I don't hold Kate Forbes' views at all. But why should they be unacceptable simply because that's what she believes in and is based on religious teaching? And we're a lot more tolerant, I think, of uh, religions such as Islam than we are of Christianity. And I think that we lampoon Christianity a lot more than we do other religions as well. I would include probably Judaism in that as well. Um, in terms of, I think it's very hard to be a Christian in politics. I think it's very hard to be a Christian in in in, in life. Uh, it, it's a tough thing. Um, I my mother is a Christian and she is someone who uh, has bears Christian witness and I I really admire her for that. I know a number of people, including her friends, who do so as well. There's a brilliant church that she's part of. There's some really really good people there. And actually, you know, when the pandemic hit, my parents are both in their seventies. Uh, when the pandemic hit, who were the first people um, bringing groceries and taking uh, grocery orders and helping um, as much as they could, going to the pharmacy? Well, the people in the church who were a bit younger, who were helping my parents. And I remember a friend of mine in London had a very 
difficult family situation a couple of years ago and I was called in the middle of the night to try to help them and I, I, I did but I sort of went you know an hour across London to do so and I just sort of thought that family actually didn't really have anybody who was nearby who could help whereas I know if something happened in Rich Hill in Northern Ireland where I'm from I could think of a hundred people mostly from the church who would come uh, to help my mum and dad if something uh, like that family situation had happened so um, I, I'm a great admirer of the church in terms of the community spirit I don't agree with everything it says. There are lots of different religions and lots of different uh, parts of each religion. And I think there's a lot of ignorance, actually, about how Christians can, um, and, and people of all religions, can contribute to politics. And Humza Youssef, actually, in the SNP example, who said, yes, I have certain beliefs, but my politics is informed in a different way. Um, I worked for one politician, James Brogenshire, sadly no longer with us. He died of cancer uh, 18 months ago. But he had a very, very strong Christian faith. But it didn't entirely inform his politics. And these things can be slightly divorced from one another. And I think your values, for example, I mean, I was brought up in, as I say, quite a religious background. And I think the values that they taught me, I think I still have. Um, I don't have the belief and the faith that uh, people in, in the church have, for example, but I think I have those values. And I think that if you uh, try, if you enter politics or public life in any way, um, you should you should try to try to put those values forward. But I do feel sorry for people who are politically engaged who suddenly the only thing that the media is interested in or the only thing that is said to kind of define them are their views on these very often very controversial kind of moral, moral issues many of whom you know a lot of whom would have seemed to be uh, out of date and certainly you know the dup democratic unionists would have not all of them but some of them would have very similar views to kate forbes that's kind of the atmosphere i grew up in in northern ireland a lot of the time it's part of the reason i wanted to leave northern ireland but at the same time i respected those people for their views and um, the thing is that uh, I, I remember seeing a great uh, meme going around one time, which is a good lesson to any politician, which is essentially, uh, you know, religion is like a penis. It's all right to have one. It's all right to be proud of it. But don't take it out and start waving it around. I shall, I shall bear that in mind, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I shall keep that in my, my head. Um, and in my trousers. Um, I'm yeah. glad. <laughs> um, yeah, where, where, yeah, I mean, and, and I agree with what you said about Kate Forbes, I, and I hold a very different theology to Kate Forbes, but she has the right to say what she wants to say. Where I think I have a greater issue with her is the way that uh, in the public debate uh, this week that she has almost lampooned every single Scottish National Party policy in the last uh, three months. And well, kind that's of just silly. And I mean, I've just, I've literally just finished reading um excellent book by James Heal and uh, Harry Cole about Liz Truss. And there was a bit backstage at one of the debates in the summer where Rishi Sunak said to Liz Truss, why are we tearing strips out of one another? Why, you know, we're just, we're just harming the Conservative Party in their, in their very, very bad tempered debates. And I think that, I think that certainly, I mean, I would criticise Kate Forbes a lot more for um, slamming him. So Yusuf, he's probably going to be the next leader of the SNP saying, you know, you're a terrible uh, transport secretary, health secretary, you know, what makes you think you'll be a good first minister? I mean, that that has done much more damage, I think, to the SNP than any of Kate Forbes' religious views. Yeah. And, and gosh, it's it's nearly time to go. But I do want to touch on uh, Northern Ireland, Peter. I've been I've been fortunate enough to go to Belfast and I, and I find it a really uh, a vibrant city, actually. A city, city seemed to be on the move in many ways. But with that, that undercurrent of, you know, things just sat there you know potent with the potential to explode do, do you think the uh the windsor uh what is it the protocol or was it framework called? windsor framework the yeah. windsor framework is is going to be uh accepted by the dup and do you think that is is good news uh for the north and and the south of ireland i don't think it's guaranteed that the dup will accept it i think the dup is a very split party at the moment and um, they've set up a sort of seven or eight member panel to look at this and they will decide, but they're taking a very long time to do so. What they don't have is backup from the Conservative Party. The ERG, the kind of um, European Research Group, very pro-Brexit group, is not what it was. It's kind of a shadow of its former self, really. And I think that they've basically decided, this is it, let's move on. I mean, the 1922 committee, the uh, Backbenchers Committee, uh, within 24 hours of the framework being uh, published, they, they spent most of the time talking about small boats in that meeting. I know that from, from people who have knowledge of the meeting rather than rather than the Windsor framework. So I think that the DEP can be, will be quite isolated if they say no to this. Uh, and also, given that devolution has been suspended, there haven't been any ministers in Northern Ireland since October last year. I think if they start banging on the doors 
and saying to people, you know, vote for us if there's an election coming up, the next election coming up. And, you know, we oppose the Windsor uh, framework because of the European Court of Justice. I think people will say, what, what possible relevance has the European Court of Justice possibly having a view on a possible trade dispute that may or may not happen? What what relevance does that have to my life? And, you know, I quite like my hip replacement. So if there was, um, if, there was if devolution got back to Stormont, well, that would that would help that in terms of the health service in Northern Ireland. So I, I think the DUP are probably running out of road politically. It'll be very, very interesting to see what they do and how they do it. But they're a very split party and they haven't been beforehand. And also we've got in exactly a month from where we speak today is the 25th anniversary of the Belfast Agreement being signed. And that's something that a lot of people really want um, devolution up and running again. I don't think it will be, but that is that is a target for that time. Yeah. Goodness me, Peter, we've, we've covered quite a lot of ground there in 30 minutes, but uh, I really love talking to you. So you've got your show tomorrow, just to plus right, yeah, between tomorrow. 10 o'clock and 1 o'clock on Saturday. So I'm preparing for that at the moment. And I've, uh, I'm just, just be doing a bit of reading and so on uh, for that in the next few hours. So looking forward to that. And when you're not doing politics, you're doing more politics. Or how do you let <laughs> well, your head? How do you let your head down, Peter? Oh, I've a decent social life. I have good, good friends, and um, I I watch a lot of Netflix. I read a lot of books. Um, I have a lovely cat as well, Jack, who's great. Takes up some of my time. But uh, no, I'm a very, very big fan of kind of going out for meals and walks and stuff with friends and just talking to friends. Just uh, and uh, I do a little bit, a little bit of exercise, running and things like that. But I'm just, uh, I'm just a, a bit of a talker and I love, I love chatting to friends and a bit of you know, gossip and intrigue, not just political but otherwise as well. Yeah, lovely. Well, I've, I've really loved talking to you, Peter. I'm really grateful for you, for, for your time coming on the Godcast, and uh, we send our best wishes to. To Burnley, your favour up this way, give us a shout and I'll make you a brew and show you the delights of, of Burnley and and, and Thanks, Gaydon. And likewise, if you're in London, Alex. God bless, Peter. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nick. Good to talk to you. Bye-bye.